So my name is uh, Matthew Schultz, I'm the CEO of Ubisoft, and uh, thank you all for getting up so early today. It's, uh, it's exciting, a pleasure to speak at such an amazing event. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Ubisoft and what we do. So uh, Ubisoft uh, basically turns your cells into drug factories, and specifically we create long-lived autologous plasma cells that secrete therapeutic proteins in vivo. And, uh, you guys are probably all familiar with the effect of these guys, even if uh, you're not specifically familiar with the cell. Um, if you take a, an 80-year-old blood, you can often detect antibodies floating around for smallpox. And these antibodies don't exist because they were recently challenged by the virus or the antigen. Uh, they exist because when they were first vaccinated or they first contracted the disease, uh, some of the cells that were producing antibodies against it became long lived and they'll persist for 70 or 80 years. So uh, our work got uh, started with a very simple problem, really, that uh, not all drugs could be administered orally. Some, uh, some drugs are quite complicated to produce and, uh, and deliver. And the, the image you see there is actually showing uh, injection site reactions from a patient taking an HIV drug called Fusion. and. This drug uh, came out a few years ago, and everyone had very high hopes for it. They thought it would be a blockbuster drug. It, uh, it had a completely different mechanism of action than normal antiretrovirals, and worked when other drugs failed. But it had a problem. Uh, you had to inject it twice a day from a freeze-dried powder to reconstitute the same objective, and it caused the injection site reaction you can see there. And so what happened is patients stopped taking it. And it had an even a worse effect that if you did stop taking it for a little bit, the virus could rebound and escape. But this drug actually failed in, in the market was pulled, uh, largely due to simple delivery issues. So to give you a little bit of background about our technology, uh, it was the core components of it were developed in a lab of David Baltimore at Caltech. And he had built a, a system to transduce a hematopoietic stem cell with a lentiviral vector and then culture it all the way into a plasma cell outside of the body that would secrete antibodies to anything you wanted. And so uh, a, a lentiviral vector, for those who don't know, is a virus that was originally derived from HIV, but it's had all the, the nasty parts removed. And so basically we used the, the machinery from the virus to deliver a new genetic payload to cells. And so in his case, he was making a, a broadly causing antibody against HIV called B12. So we uh, licensed this technology and modified it to work with uh, B cells that were just floating around peripheral blood. And uh, this uh, has some great advantages. Probably the, the biggest one is that you can reduce the culture time it takes to make these cells down from 10 weeks to only 10 days. But it comes some challenges, and that is the lentiviral vector that he was using to modify stem cells it doesn't work very well in primary lymphocytes. And so the way we got around this initially was by taking the, the core of the HIV virus and putting the shell of the measles virus on top of it. We pseudotyped it. And uh, this uh, made it vastly more infectious. And it could easily infect uh, B cells at an efficient rate. Although it also came with another problem, and that is that the measles virus pseudotype plenty is uh, quite a pain to manufacture. It kills the producer cells relatively rapidly and it causes a fairly low titers. Eventually, we were able to overcome that by actually modifying our culture system to work with the original virus, which is uh, quite significant in terms of uh, just a production issue. So uh, this chart shows how we're actually describing the development of our cells. Um, on the, the far left here, you see uh, resting in memory B cells. And uh, we're watching this with CD20 and CD38. Um, if any of you guys are immunologists, you may notice that we're not mentioning CD138 here, which is a, a typical plasma cell marker. And the reason for that is, is that our, our goal for this is to generate uh, plasma blasts instead of plasma cells. Plasma blasts are the immediate precursor to the plasma cell, and they maintain their uh, hemokine pooling receptor, uh, CXCR4, which will guide them into bone marrow, which is important later. Um, we also can expand these cells significantly in culture. We've done it up to 100 fold. And uh, that allows us to start with a relatively simple blood draw, but get enough treatments to even do multiple dose. 
We also uh, have a couple safety features that have been added to this. Uh, some that exist purely by virtue of its design, but, uh, but all that give it a, an interesting advantage over traditional gene therapies. So a lot of the more traditional therapies start by mod modifying a stem or progenitor cells. And uh, one of the problems with this is that if you modify them and you put them back in the body, they will expand and differentiate and mature in ways that are very unpredictable. And so in, uh, in our case, for example, if you're making an HIV antibody with a B cell, but you start by modifying a stem cell, then if uh, that particular clone encounters its antigen, like say uh, like you get a cold or something like that, and your, your B cell clone gets activated, it could increase your dose by a million fold. The cell could make lots and lots of copies of itself and be producing your treatment along with it. And that may or may not be okay with an HIV antibody, but it could be lethal in other treatments. Um, so having a terminally differentiated cells allows us to avoid some of the risks of unintended downstream consequences. What we put in the cells, they basically are uh, the way they're going to be forever. The other thing we did was add a suicide gene to the system. Uh, we didn't invent this, but uh, it's been used in humans already uh, for graft versus host disease originally. And it allows us to wipe out all the cells that we put in in less than an hour by administering a simple small molecule drug. Yeah. The way this works is it, it's an inducible version of caspase 9, which is actually the same uh, mechanism the, uh, the Draco uh, molecule that was talked about yesterday by Dr. Reiner uses. And, uh, but ours is inducible, not, uh, not recruited. Uh, so currently, we are busy focusing on how to make this uh, in GMP levels uh, suitable for human trials and, uh, and also optimizing the uh, dosing schedule, which is kind of a, an interesting. Uh, point that I can touch on real quickly. If uh, your body seems to have a way of limiting how many of these cells could become long-lived at once, there, there's no difference fundamentally between a long-lived plasma cell and a short-lived plasma cell. They're the same kind of cell. They're uh, what's called conditionally immortalized. So if the short-lived cell makes it into a survival niche, it becomes long-lived. And if you knock it out of that niche, it dies again. And uh, so if you think about it though, when you develop an infection, you make lots of these, only a small number find their way into these niches. And your body has some system of regulating how many can engraft at once. And uh, otherwise you could potentially have your entire long-lived repertoire overwritten by a single very large infection. And so uh, we're busy optimizing the dose for figuring out what the proper interval is to maximize the level of engraftment without uh, just loading them up with lots of cells that are gonna die anyway. Before uh, I go too much farther, I think it makes sense to give you guys a, a high-level overview of how this uh, would work therapeutically and how it's been working in animal studies. Um, basically, a patient would go to a clinic, they get a simple blood draw, the blood is shipped to our lab, where uh, we will isolate out their immune cells, we transduce them with the virus, so we expand and culture them, and then we freeze them down in aliquots for dosing and send them back. This is a, an interesting advantage. Um, if you uh, are familiar with a company called Dendrion, a treatment called Provenge, they're the, the first approved cell therapy in the US. And one of the issues they have is that they can't freeze down the final product. So they have to send the cells uh, shipped refrigerated, but they have, a, I think, a maximum life of about 18 hours before they get back to the patient or the toast. And uh, you can freeze them, they can last obviously much longer. This uh, illustration, which I, I lifted from a paper, it, I think shows uh, really well uh, what's happening here. So uh, I, I put it just as a little background for those who are uh, B cell biologists. But uh, B cells, when they're developing, they're hematopoietic stem uh, cells. So they start from the hematopoietic stem cell, they turn into the pre B cells in the bone marrow, and then leave it as naive or resting B cells they can uh, be activated by encountering the antigen that their receptor binds to. And uh, then they uh, begin to mature and will turn into a plasma cell, a plasma blast, make lots of antibodies. And typically they'll die. The, uh, but if they migrate themselves back to the bone marrow, as that, they survive and they get to their niche. We can actually take uh, cells that are resting, activated, or memory cells for our system. Um, they have a, strengths and weaknesses. We can actually make them make a hop like this down to this section as well. So we, we can deviate slightly from how they naturally develop. But when uh, we first started, there is a 
Yeah. There's a reasonable number of people who thought the idea was crazy, to be honest, and that it wouldn't work at all. So uh, we started with our uh, fairly basic proof of concept, and we took uh, B cells from a healthy person and uh, transduced them, as I've described, with this lentivirus. But uh, the lentivirus carried a gene for GFP, so they would fluoresce cream. And, uh, then, uh, but the promoter that was controlling it was only active in plasma cells. So you transduce the B cell, nothing would happen, but if you cultured it for a while, then it would light up. So this uh, simple study here demonstrated that we could not only modify the cells the way we thought we could, but we could also mature them into a functional function. Uh, an interesting side point is you'll notice all this random crap here, and those are uh, feeder cells. And the initial version of the system we licensed from Caltech required feeder cells to function. And we've uh, eliminated those in our current system. So it's a nice thing we accomplished over the last year. Um, the next thing we did was we made these same cells produce an HIV antibody, uh, B12 initially, the same one David Baltimore did. And then uh, when we got our breakout lab grant later, we also made them produce a lysosomal enzyme. And that's an important thing because the B cells normally produce antibodies. The thought that you could make them produce a specific one isn't that big of a stretch. But the idea that you could make them produce other therapeutic proteins is in function more as a generic factor even was. And so that was uh, one of the key things we were trying to prove with that brand. The, uh, the other thing I'll throw out here is interesting in history is I believe we're the first group that was able to modify B cells, uh, primary B cells, <laughs> to secrete specific problem causing antibodies in a way that was clinically viable. You can, you can think about this, the problem of causing antibody disease. Uh, in HIV, we've been uh, studying these for years. And the people who are called elite controllers or elite suppressors, and they secrete these antibodies that keep them safe for a very long time. They, they catch the virus, but they don't get sick, or it's slowly. And no one has ever been able to elicit them effectively with a vaccine. So having a technology that can directly program them to secrete it instead is, is quite advantageous. So, uh, once we'd done the in vitro stuff, we started doing an in vivo proof of concept. The, the goal of this was fairly simple. We wanted to show that the cells, the human cells we modified, would properly engraft in the mice, that they would move to the bones the way we thought they would. And uh, we were relatively confident that, that would happen because the chemokine receptor that guides them is cross-reactive in mice. They're quite similar. But, uh, but what happened that we didn't expect, and it was really cool, is that the survival niches in the mice actually kept them alive far longer than we expected. We thought most of them would die in a couple weeks. We actually had these uh, survive out to uh, over 100 days. And so uh, there's one other thing I'll point out here, in that uh, the way we culture the cells matters a lot in how they survive. It's a really interesting piece of IP that got developed rather unexpectedly. That these two mice right here have the same treatment and the cells looked quite similar under flow cytometry, as I showed before. Um, but these guys engrafted really well, and these ones virtually croaked. Um, so they didn't last nearly as long. The uh, other thing I'll point out that's kind of interesting is you can see them going to the bone that highlights their own from the cap and the toes and that kind of stuff. But they also diffused around the body fairly broadly, more so than we expected. And that's, uh, it's interesting if that bears out going into larger models. This is just a graph showing the uh, total luminescence from those uh, glowing cells um, over time, how we track it. You can see uh, most of them die relatively rapidly, and then some become more stable and grafted. And as you can see here, the, the mouse niche still isn't perfect, but uh, it, it works better than we thought. So our uh, focus for this initially, commercially, is uh, in rare diseases. And uh, we're doing our proof of concept in MPS1. And that's, that's a rare genetic disease where people can't produce an enzyme that need. And so they will uh, basically begin to, to melt down from birth. They have a life expectancy of less than 13 years. And the way it's currently treated is you inject a recombinantly produced an enzyme. But this costs about a quarter million dollars a year. And it only extends your life to about a year and a half. It also requires weekly infusions at a hospital, about three hours long. And so a technology like ours could, could make their own cells produce this indefinitely, and hopefully <coughs> pretty well. Um, HIV is, uh, we think, probably the fastest path to clinical trials. And uh, the reason for that, which I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a second, um, but is that uh, going into clinical trials for rare diseases involves going to a child that's one or two years old and is already very sick. And going to HIV allows us to show that uh, this works, the platform is functioning, we can produce things, but in an adult, it's relatively healthy. Um, and then heart disease, which I'll touch on in a second. 
So I'm going to go through this very quickly. About, so we're hoping to be in clinical trials in 2016, funding dependent, of course. Um, but uh, we're working with the collaborators at UCSF um, and re recently infected stably treated HIV patients. The, we'll put, inject them with modified cells and secrete a cocktail of probably neutralizing antibodies. And the goal is going to be to outright eradicate the virus. And so it's a, it's a big jump. And of course, the primary goal for the study is safety. Uh, uh, as a company, we will evaluate the platform as well. So this, uh, okay, let's start wrapping up here, um, is uh, where we start to get into life extension and health extension. And uh, ApoA1 Milano, I think probably people here are familiar with it, but I'm going to anyway. It's a, a mutant version of apolipoprotein A1, a constituent to good cholesterol, HDL. And this was found in a family, an extended family outside of Milan, and it gave them uh, incredible <coughs> resistance to heart disease. And it was interesting enough that some scientists uh, isolated the compound, took the sequence, and produced it recombinantly in uh, Cho cells, and then injected it in people in the US with advanced atherosclerosis. The results were remarkable. It caused measurable reduction in arterial plaque in only five weeks. It's so impressive, in fact, that Pfizer bought them for $1.3 billion before they even uh, published the phase two clinical results. And uh, they subsequently scrapped the project. But uh, a technology like ours has, has the ability to make anybody produce this. And uh, so this is kind of what we're going after here. Not just uh, making things that are a pain to deliver, but giving people as a whole the ability to take the best traits of humanity or the best traits we've invented in the lab. Like I was uh, personally quite uh, inspired by the droplet molecule. And uh, something that jumped out at me during the Q&A with that was that a uh, doctor had said, well, you can't make enough to go through this right now. And that I'm sure they'll, they'll solve that problem at some point. But a technology like ours could effectively make mankind virtually impervious to one of the greatest scourges of life on Earth, the virus. So we're looking at ways to, to not just treat the disease uh, in particular, but to almost, you know, evolve the species. And uh, not, I mean, there, as, as the commenters uh, pointed out, there could be uh, issues with wiping out all the viruses in a person. But uh, the, the ability to produce things that are, are significant jumps. So even in like our HIV trial, if we added that, you could potentially target the latent viral reservoir with that. So as soon as it became inactive, uh, the cells would die. It'd be a very impressive project. Um, the, uh, the main goal, and that it's farther away, I suppose, is to, to look at really recreating the, the biochemical environment of youth as we age. And, if you think about it, if you take your blood you know, once a year for your whole life, it will change drastically. The, the factors in it are not the same. And with a technology like ours, you can potentially put back what's missing. Uh, all those subtle little differences, uh, in, or the ones that matter, the ones that are beneficial, that would be impractical to ever administer as a drug that couldn't be made to a pill. And you, couldn't, you wouldn't really want to shoot yourself up every you know, hour or so with some of these little short lived molecules. But a technology like this is stable. I mean, the half-life of these cells in vivo is supposed to be 17 years. And so you're looking at major changes. I think I'm about out of time, so I'll uh, wrap this up. I have way too many people uh, to thank and acknowledge and I can fit on one slide. But this is uh, some of our, our core team and our collaborators here. And of course, uh, thank you to Breakout Labs who is here uh, for enabling the proof of concept that you saw most of here. Thank you. <laughs>